Hey, 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 hey. Speak to me cleanly if you're oh, going to stop speak. stealing my slang. It's already bro. stolen. I go around the well, station. I stole it from Solitaire, so. Really? Yeah. So I'm stealing from Solitaire. I go around the station and people, I, I heard the other day someone asked Saif <laughs> if he'd heard a saying that I stole from him. That's how well I steal your shit. <laughs> Yo, we have an awesome guest today on yes. Epstein for the kids. Um, MCA from the Beastie Boys. Yes. Incredible. Do you, can I say legend or you don't like you don't like that, right? Make you feel old? Hey, what have I you hate gotta it. Say, what have you got to say? Fucking legend. <laughs> Fucking legend in the game, man. <clears throat> I'll just try and soak it up. Yeah, I mean, does that does that get old though? Like, like sometimes does it get annoying to have people approach you on such a legend tip all the time? Or you're like, yo, I'm still doing shit. Like, I just made a movie. What's I only get it once in a while, so you know. <laughs> Full shit. I don't believe that for a second. Well, you look, you you look like a regular guy. Like you could walk around the streets and not yeah. get harassed. But I'm sure there's times where people are like, "Yo, the fucking beastie." But boy. I'm thinking about getting a look. Like I want to get like crazy like bandanas and like you know like <laughs> tie like weird like rips in my jeans and get like a look so that people will know me. You should. I, maybe it's a little late for me is to there, cultivate the look. Is there one of you guys that gets recognized the most for some reason? Well, the, the, actually, the thing is that we all get recognized as Mike D. Like you basically anywhere you go. <laughs> Dudes are just like, dudes yelling across the street to me like, yo, Mike D. Yo, let's smoke a bowl, Mike D. Like, I'm not wait, and, Mike D. And wait, and MC and Adrak are both named Adam. Yes. So, so, I, so we have the odds, right? Right. You would think. You would think so. You think everyone would just say Adam and you'd be safe. No. But instead they call right. you Mike D. So it's two out of three. You're going to get an Adam. And we used to get it all the time. People always just come up, yo, yo, which one's Mike D? I want to meet Mike D. I mean, he's like, what's, Why? <laughs> Did Mike D get the most uh, play on the road early on? Why? Uh, come on! What you you, were, you? This was years before you were married. Your wife doesn't think that you got play on the road early on. You were the fucking Beastie Boys for God's sake! What are we talking about here? What are we? Don't we have some shirts to give away or something? <laughs> hey, listen, man. I'm on, sorry. All on, I want. I've seen there's no format. MCA. Just... MCA. MCA doesn't realize that I'm a dirt ball <laughs> who just wants to hear about the benefits of being a Beastie Boy. I'm telling you, let me tell you right now, being Peter Rosenberg, another uh, white Jew in hip-hop, not nearly as glamorous as being a Beastie Boy. So I'm trying to hope that someone got to live the the glamour life along the way. What? So are you guys, like, still, I mean, what? do you still listen to hip-hop regularly? Yeah. Yeah, but I do, I, I do find myself listening to a lot of old-school hip-hop. Like, what do you listen to, old-school shit? Um, I, mean, I, I listen to probably stuff that's from... From the the late seventies, like on up through like the mid nineties, but you know I need to catch up. I need to catch up on the last ten years. Well, when bit. when was the first when was the first Beastie Boys record? Well, the first record was a hardcore record, was a <clears throat> punk record that came oh, right. out in, in nineteen eighty eighty two, beginning eighty two. It came out seven inch. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, seven inch with eight songs on it. What? Yeah, that's the way they used to do them. The punk records were were like EPs. And they, because all the songs were like, you know, a minute long or 30 so seconds long. So you played, you them. guys played instrument? Yeah. We started out, like I was the bass player, Mike was the singer, mm. Ad Rock was a guitar player, and this girl, Kate Schellenbach, used to play drums. Oh, Kate Schellenbach, of course. <laughs> I don't know that is. <laughs> what, what, do, what, how, I mean, I, I always knew about that record, but I don't know anything about it. Like, how well did it do? Like, how much of a buzz did that garner? It, within the, within the like, hardcore community, you know, people people knew it, but it was a small group of people that were into that kind of music. So, you know, there was probably, like, whatever, 50 or 100 kids like, in New York that were into that type of music. Is that, like, is that like CBGBs? Or exactly. We played CBs team? and Maxes. We used to open up for Bad Brains, like, you know, Minor Threat, like, bands like that. That was what was going on. And so you made that in 82. Yeah. And then... But at the same time, we were listening to hip-hop. Like, I, like... Even like probably just before I got into punk, I started find like I found this Spoonie G record mm. on the actually on the street. Somebody was throwing away a stack of like twelve inches, and I picked them up and brought them home. And I started listening to this Spoonie G record, and I just kind of listened to it over and over again. Started, Which Spoonie G record? I think it was called like Spanking and Freaking or something like that. It's the one that starts with with just the beat and the cowbell. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I don't really know any Spoonie G. That's why I <laughs> I've never really known any Spoonie G. And then we kind of got into like we started. We would all like buy every twelve inch was coming out. We were listening to like Treacherous Three and and Funky Four Plus One and you know Master Don Committee, like whatever was coming you, out. We but were going BC Boys are from Brooklyn or from low, uh, Manhattan? I'm from Brooklyn, but the other two guys are from the city. From from, from LES or like? No, uh, Mike is for, actually from the Upper West Side, and oh. Adam is from the West Village. Okay, and where are you from in Brooklyn? From like Atlantic Avenue and Court Street, Brooklyn, 
Brooklyn, pick it up. Um, okay, so then you did. You so you buying? I'm sorry if I'm taking it too detailed, no, but I just this is like stuff I always wanted to know. Like, um, so you made the punk record, and then what? Rick Rubin found you guys, or no? Nah, we started. We were kind of like rhyming at, at the same time. We were just like we we're kind of like really into hip hop, and then we kind of we went in the studio. We made this really weird record called Cookie Puss where we just kind of like played a drum beat and like bass line and, and started scratching over it, just scratched yeah. in a bunch of weird stuff over it. So we put that out as a 12 inch. And then when we started playing that live, then we started rhyming in our show. We started mm. kind of like, we'd switch off, we'd play some punk and then we'd, we'd like kind of like rhyme for a while. And we actually were looking for a DJ to do the show with and Rick was like some cat from around there. Someone was like, oh, you should get this dude Rick. He knows how to DJ a little bit. And so Rick came and DJed for us. Mm. And Rick was really into, like, he was running the entertainment committee at NYU. So he was bringing cats like Africa Bambata, Jazzy J, down to play and, and down to play at his school. And gotcha. those guys kind of schooled him on DJing. Like, Jazzy J started showing Rick how to DJ. Mm. And so then Rick kind of wanted to be a producer. Rick produced this record with Tila Rock and Jazzy J called It's, it's Yours. yours. And it, which is an amazing record. Yeah, it's one of the big ones. And then that's how he met Russell, because then Russell loved It's Yours, and so then Russell and Rick met, and they kind of connected and started hanging out. And they put and out It's Yours, right? Def Jam, that was the first Def Jam record. Yeah, that, okay. That was it's the, Yours? Yeah, it was the first one that had the Def Jam logo it had on it. It actually it. came out through somebody else, but Rick just put the Def Jam logo right. on it. yeah, yeah. That's Rick right. put his address at his dorm, like a P.O. box in the back. <laughs> that's Actually, and, that's how LL Cool J... Sent Went his tape into that to that address. Yeah, and, fuck. And Ad Rock was going through a box of tapes in Rick's drawers, like list. I mean, in Rick's dorm, like listening to all the tapes, and he found that one. I need a beat. It was like LL, like rhyming over, a, you know, like I don't know. He might have been rhyming over a metronome or something, to, with saying I need a beat. And Adam was like to saying to Rick, like, yo, you should check this one out. This kid's good, you know. Fuck, that's, that's crazy. That's, you cool with LL now? Yeah, if I run into LL, he's always cool. Yeah. Damn. And then who, okay, this is a strange connection. I do a comedy show once a month. The lady who runs the comedy show, the booking side of it, her husband was Rick Rubin's roommate. The guy, he was a video director. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I bet I know his name. Um, is it Adam or? Adam Dubin or something like yeah, that? Yeah, yep. Right, so, so Rick had this and, roommate. And yeah, there's yeah. a book, I think it's Rick Rubin's, or somebody's book. Is it Rick Rubin's book? And the first line is something like, me and my roommate Adam started bang and she's always like she's like oh it's russell's book uh, she's like i went into rick's room and adam was there like it's like the first line that's funny yeah russell i mean russell was a character so when russell and rick met russell asked that he wanted to manage us and russell was like his management like you can't even picture the way russell he had this like bummy little office with like a dirty couch Where? in there up on he was on broadway and uh, and like 26th Street. Mm. Like and how old there. is Russell at this point? This is like, we're talking about 1983, maybe 84. So Russell's so a kid, too. He essentially. Was, he was older than us, though. He was probably like in his 30s or something, and we were probably like... No. In, he couldn't have been. That's yeah, 20, he was definitely older than us. 25. I don't know. I he, he could seemed, have been 30. He seemed older. Yeah, he and could he have been 30 like, by then, because that's 25. That would make him 50, 58 now or something like that. Yeah, he could have that been 28, old? 28 years old. Yeah, Russell's, Russell's that old. His big, his big acts, Russell's big acts were Fuck. like Curtis Blow and like, uh, he managed all the like Spider D. He was managing them. Yeah, Houdini, like all these people. This was before LL. Right. And uh, he managed Run DMC, but Run DMC were on profile. Right. And uh, and then Russell. No, you know, he's related to one of the guys from Run DMC. <laughs> Is that true? Yeah, he's the, I think Look, the Run one. You learn a lot on this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so then what happened? So then, you know, Rick and Russell started talking about starting a label together. Mm. So that's how that jumped off. And they took you guys, and so Russell managed you guys at first. He yeah, did Russell take you on. Russell wanted to manage us, yeah. And did he? he, he was a, yeah, he did. He managed us. Yeah. And, and, and they let him try a couple things. <laughs> they let him try a couple things. And so where did you guys come in in terms of the order of records that came out on Def Jam? What, what number were you guys? We got 12 inches out first. Right. Yeah, right. the first 12-inch we put out would have been the Rock Hard 12-inch Rock hard with Beastie Groove on the other side, which is a crap record. <laughs> but um, <laughs> and that might have been right after LL's. Like like maybe I need a beat was like the first one after it's yours, something like that. And then Rock Hard might have been the third one. I don't know. And then how how far from that was it before you guys were, before the Beastie Boys were really popping everywhere? That was probably '85, and we 
And then we were recording License to Ill probably in 85, beginning of 86. And the whole License, album. License to Ill came out towards the end of 86. And it really it really popped in 87, though. What's your uh, what's your favorite one? Critically, it's like everyone loves... Paul's Boutique is generally these days like the one that everyone says is like your your masterpiece. But what would you say is your your favorite? I don't know. I kind of like like some of those ones like like Check Your Head Nail Communication when we went back to playing instruments yeah. and started incorporating it with with hip hop. I mean, I like all of them in different ways at different times, but but to me that was kind of interesting like bringing those two things back together like playing instruments and rhyming over. This it. fucking kid I went to high school with. He was like like when you were doing the rocks. I was like heavy quote unquote hip hop dude. And he's like, "No, nah, this Beastie Boy shit is crazy." Um, so what you want? And he was playing it crazy. Wasn't there a Mugs remix? Yeah, the Mugs remix. The Soul Assassins remix was crazy. Fire. But his, so he's playing he's like this is crazy and he used to on a radio station here in New York I think every night at 10 they used to play uh, get the lead out just Led Zeppelin joints like three Led Zeppelin joints and he was like all into rock and I'm like yo this is fucking whack yo I'm, I'm a hip hop dude and then I got into that BC Boys song um, so what you want I was like yo this shit is fucking crazy That's and funny. I was like and then I, I used to study like album covers and when you had like the studio with all like the instruments and like I was like yo this is what I want to do I, this I, is it that's cool this is it Pass the Mic was the one for me from that record I mean I love So What You Want too but I really loved Pass the Mic the fucking video was so weird yeah that was when was you guys were really getting with all like the weird reverse lenses and shit and all kind of weird shit in the forest for the Pass the Mic video so no So What You Want is the one oh Such What Is the, the Forest yeah. yeah Pass the Mic is the one where we're like actually behind our studio and there's like a weird flight of like metal stairs. Oh yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like but a all, fire escape. How how big a part of that were, were you? Like were you into the video stuff at that oh, point yeah, already? Those were both videos I directed. So what you want to pass the mic? So what you want? You directed that? Yeah. That shit's crazy. So that's the original Blair Witch. Yep. In the woods with the colors and shit. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Original. Indeed. So <laughs> and and now you did this movie. We should plug his movie on the podcast as well. He has a movie that... Oh, that's right. That is why I'm here. Right? Yeah, that is why you're here to plug this movie. Not, um, I just watched it, gunning for that number one spot. Um, to, uh, it's it's about... You, I just made you explain it on Hot 97, so I'll give a quick synopsis, but it's basically a documentary about the Elite 24. Was it the first game? Was that the first Elite 24 basketball game? Yeah, that was what the first What is that? One. What's Elite 24? Elite 24 is, is an annual um, all-star game, high school all-star game at the Rucker in Harlem that brings together the top high school basketball players from around the country from the, from, from the whole country yeah normally these games are are separated like normally the kids are split up by their sneaker affiliations like you only have In high the, school yeah you only have the nike all-star game or the oh. all-star game and often they're they're split up where it'll only be seniors like the mcdonald's game is only seniors right so this was the first game of its kind the that just brings together all the top high school players in the country any, regardless any and, uh, affiliation any grade anything yeah. just a top and then to have them outdoors at the Rucker in Harlem like that's that's a big part of why I wanted to do the doc is because I just thought it was amazing to have this game up there and this was the first one of its kind really? yeah. yeah so now it's an annual thing now it's an annual but thing but yeah. you shot this when um, September 06 so the 06. so the kids who were in it four of them just went to the NBA on yeah. Thursday First Many round. of them are still in college right now, and a couple are still in high school about yeah. to, yeah, like there's... Lance Stevenson from Coney Island, not even in college yet. Exactly, yeah. So it's, it's really bugged, though, because I watched it the night of the draft, so I literally saw a kid I liked. I was like, Green's from Baltimore, right? Dante, yeah. Dante Green's from Baltimore. I'm from D.C. So like when I saw Dante Green from Baltimore, I was like, oh, shit, I hope this kid made it. And he's like, he like loves his little brother and shit and all that. And I was like, this guy seems like a good kid. I literally go to ESPN.com. He'd gotten drafted like... Five minutes earlier, yeah. So it's a very interesting way to watch Dante it. Dante got drafted. He's great. Um, I, th I think he actually should have gone earlier in the draft. I think people don't realize how strong Dante's going. Well, they be. didn't. They probably didn't see as much as you saw because you like. You I mean, know. he went. He went twenty eight. I think he could have gone. He was like, a freshman though, right? He could have gone closer to twenty. He was a freshman, right? Um, he he just did his freshman year. Does it matter? He just did one year. There's a rule now that kids have to go to one, one year. One year, college. yeah. I read that. And so he. Did his first year? Yeah, it matters though. I mean, you know, like what you see in someone, they, they a lot of times they will see in a player a ton of potential, but maybe if they, you know, being a freshman, no, it's hard to. No, I'm saying, does it matter? Uh, Dante went. Oh no, I'm spacing on. Uh, and and, uh, Mar and Mar we Maryland played them this year. Uh, who the fuck was it? Was it the one with the the one they had the jerseys on? They had the jerseys. They were the ones with the jerseys. Who Not Virginia, that? Virginia Tech. Anyways, what I I know that Dante wanted to go to Maryland. He was and yeah. and for some reason Gary didn't. Uh, Coach Gary Williams from Maryland wasn't Our, interested in him. You played for that team. I went to Maryland. Did you play for the team? Didn't play for the team. 
but we weren't interested in him apparently, which sucks. And apparently he talked some serious shit about him after our game in the uh after like dropping bombs on us in his press conference, he was like, "You fucked up, Gary." <laughs> um, did you? Did you? Got, I've noticed though, like, it's an overwhelmingly positive documentary. Um, it's not particularly um, like a aggr- like you. You didn't really attack any of the negatives that I'm sure are out there in terms of you. In, you hinted at it, yeah. The, the the shoe companies and stuff. But was there was there stuff that you decided not to use to keep it sort of positive? Yeah, I, I felt like I didn't want to go like full on like the Geraldo Rivera expose piece. Like I really just wanted the film to like look at these kids' lives and and certainly talk about some of the challenges that they face or or some of the things that go on because, you know, their their lives are kind of hectic in a way. It is, it's exciting, but it's also hectic to be a a 16-year-old kid and being pulled in every direction. You got, everybody's got something to say to you. You know, you're getting written about, getting critiqued, like right in front of these kids. People are saying like, like, oh, he needs to work on his... uh, you know, this game, I don't think he's going to be that strong a player in the NBA. They'll be saying, like, right in front of the... You know, it's it's a lot of heavy stuff. And uh, they're getting pulled by, like, sneaker companies, and they got coaches, and, and they, of course, their families, in many cases, are kind of depending on them to succeed. And so Man. so we wanted to look at, at some of the, the pressures, but in a lot of ways, I just wanted to, like, celebrate, you know... You know, I mean, they're, they're kids that are just really passionate about playing ball, so... So yeah, we didn't go too crazy. You left. We you, like, you just you just did a teeny. Uh, I'm sorry. I really am coming off like a pervert in this interview. But you really you did just a teeny bit on the girls aspect. Uh, that was that was an aspect that I'd imagine is interesting for these kids. Is that from an early age, not only the access they have to women, but also the the weird and sometimes not so healthy circumstances in which they. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting that these guys are so passionate about playing ball that they'll go against their their basic instincts. Like like most of these guys will say like I'm you know yeah the, the girls are there but I'm I'm not going to go after the girls because because you know what you mess up and and you're going to ruin your career. So people really they're drove so, that message home to them. Yeah, they're so focused on on ball that that a lot of them and not probably not all of them but some of them are are like going against that basic instinct and I thought that was pretty interesting that they were you know to be a 16 year old kid and decide that you're not going to go chase ass you're going to play basketball is, is interesting yeah I, I say there's there's a reason that I'm not in the NBA <laughs> I played good in three games I, I would have had herpes by Saturday night <laughs> this is it's on it's a great film though it really is Let me, you want a question a copy of that oh, oh the uh, DVD yeah oh well, 1995 <laughs> we're moving these <laughs> It's got the thing. What's the name of the company, the production company? Oscilloscope. Is that Actually, you? I started my own distribution company, and we're, we're distributing independent films. Oh, is this playing everywhere, by the way? It's opening in, like, about 10 cities first, and then it'll go out to... to Do you know what the cities are? Because our nerds are dispersed all over the country. You know what, and they don't I'm going to tell it. people to look at gunandmovie.com. G-U-N-N-I-N movie.com. Has the list of it. And that lists all the theaters that it's playing in, because... Otherwise, I'm going to mess it up. I, I really I don't want to go see it in the theater now at, at the Magic Johnson in this Harlem. This movie is I'll, meant to be seen at the theater. It's got a crazy surround sound mix ooh. with like, and also you know with surround sound you have crazy subwoofers built into the movie theater. So I was pumping the hip hop tracks into the into the subwoofers, and like just the way it's shot and the way it's mixed, it's definitely meant to be seen the theater. Yeah, yeah. I'm probably going to go to the 11th Street one. I try to stay away from the Magic Johnson theater. Yeah, I know you're not doing that. It's it. Say it. I know why. Oh, I know you're loud in there. I know you're they're not yelling. I don't way, yell. I want to listen. There's to nothing the movie. to yell at in this movie, though. Like they're gonna yell. They'll ooh and ah at some of the moves. You might get some ooing and ahing, but yeah. They're but yelling. Anyway, this 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 movie's good uptown too because it's just a few blocks from the Rucker. So. That's that's why I want to check it out. I am be sweet. I got stranded at the Rucker once. I'm not I'm not a fan. What happened? Yeah, I was shooting MTV. It rained. I, was, I didn't have a ride. Let's not get into that. <laughs> Can you go play? Is is the Rucker open generally? Yeah. Do you just go shoot there? It's a regular park. Yeah, it's a regular park during the day, but then they have these, like, tournaments there. You ever ball there? I shot around with cats. I definitely, yeah, a little bit. When we were up there filming, I was was just shooting around. How's your game? I like to think it's all right, you know, but I I don't think I'm I'm not making myself eligible for the draft anytime soon. But we play all the time. I play, like, like two or three days a week. You ever play with Bobito? I played with Bob before. He's nice, right? Yeah, Bob is good. Bob is good. What's your game I'll like? Fuck Bob up on the court. Yeah. <laughs> you, are, you, are, you are you a you a jump shooter? I, I don't have much of an outside shot. I'm working on that. I'm working so what on do you have? Shot. I'd rather try and bring it inside. Really? Yeah. Down Ballsy. 
Not me. He's into galactic, so you know, he's got to get right in there. <laughs> That's very true. Yo, man, thanks for hanging out with us and doing a little Juan Epstein. I know you're a busy guy. You're promoting this movie. No, it's great. Cool. Thanks for having me on. You got, how, how, how rich are you? Crazy. Crazy rich. Actually, actually, I knew it. Actually, no, I knew it. I knew it. Honestly, not not as rich as most cats who, who do what we do because we're really picky about like advertising. We don't. We don't do like the Beastie we don't Boys. let people use our music in TV commercials. Really? Why not? Because I don't want I don't want to see my I don't want to see my face on a right guard commercial. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like you're good though. Like the way I grew up seeing musicians, like like the way that their music is used is really important to me. You know, yeah. like it, it means something. So, so like I mean, we do all right with playing people shows ask. And, and selling records, but yeah, I mean that's what most musicians that that have crazy money it's because they get thrown crazy money thrown at them from advertising Licensing. right but you, so people ask you to use your songs for doing but yeah people ask all the time like, and you just say you just I mean once in a while we'll do things specifically for films if we like the film or if right. it's for you know if it's connected with something that makes sense but we're not just like so all three of you have to make the decision doing a sprite commercial or right some shit. All three of you have to sit and make the decision yeah. when it comes in. The Sprite commercials are actually pretty good, though. <laughs> those early '90s ones, with Large Professor, those were actually pretty good. Yeah, or, I mean, I don't want. But call, I know the, I, I don't want to call people out, but it's just the way. Not all your music is, coming up is like a punk band too, like you know, punk. No, it goes against your nature. I, 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 you don't have to explain it to me. Where do you, where do you live? And uh, actually, just like three blocks from the station. <laughs> really? Seriously. And our studio is down on Canal Street, right, like five blocks from here. Oh, word up. What are you guys, uh, have you guys made any official uh, endorsement for Obama yet? I'll do it right now. I don't know if I've made an official endorsement, but I'm so psyched that Obama got the nomination. Word? Yeah, we're pretty... Why pretty, is that? I think he's amazing. I think he's, regardless, race, gender aside, I think the, the guy just has heart. He's, yeah, I, I, I'm not I, into politics at all, but... um. I I feel like this guy's been pushing me like on Obama, and the, him pushing me makes me go against it because I hate to be pushed. I'm sorry, I know. But I keep watching the guy, and I'm like, yo, I kind of like this guy. Yeah, man. He's, 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 he seems I sincere. I mean, he seems as sincere as you could hope for for someone in the position that he's in. Exactly. Yeah. So word up, you heard it. that's an official MCA from the Beastie Boys endorsement. I feel pretty comfortable saying that. He's Ad super Rock political, and, like his whole family's like into politics. So <laughs> he pushes this shit on me. It drives me crazy. I I feel comfortable saying that Ad Rock and Mike D are probably also gonna definitely yeah yeah we're supporting them. All you hear you hear about your boy uh, Ralph Nader shooting himself in the foot this week? Do you hear about that? No. What do you do? What do you do this time? Oh, un Uncle, not not Uncle Ralph, the the anti Uncle Ralph, Ralph Nader um, started talking ish about Obama, and. Uh, said some stuff that I don't think he intended to be racist. He just thought it was real talk, but didn't really know his role and felt like he could just say whatever he wanted and came out and basically said that he feels like Obama's talking white to people and is trying to kiss up to white people and not really do anything for the black community. Now, I can't believe people are so focused on, on race and gender but, with this whole thing. They the... couldn't even talk about Obama without talking about race, and they couldn't talk about Hillary without talking about gender. Or, uh, gender. It's like... Just look at these people and see what they gotta say. Who cares? You know, like they, people gotta look at at the at them as people and see look, what's behind, see what they have to say. Who are they? What what's their intentions? I think you have two things against you right now. You're an artist, and you live and you're from New York, <laughs> and we 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 from New York see things differently. It's true, you know. And you go, I'm sure you travel all around. You go to the rest of the country, and it's like. Well, hold on. Like, that, but then everyone always does that. In the same sentence where they big up New York for being such an open-minded place, they're closed-minded and they shit on middle America. Like, no, not, no one has the mentality that we have in New York. There are I'm plenty saying, of good people out there like no, that. I'm, the yeah, there way. are. But I'm saying there's, there's a lot of people that just follow the norm. Like, okay, boom. Being from New York, I, and I don't know why you don't get this. Oh, yeah, because you're not from New York. Thank you. But we have a third eye. We have a third eye. When you see like Fox News and it says fair and balanced, we go, if you're fair and balanced, you wouldn't, your slogan wouldn't be fair and balanced. <laughs> so we automatically go, eh, chill out, Fox News. But other places where there's just, I'm not saying middle America's whack, I'm just saying the norm, the I regular think, yeah. status quo, oh, they're fair and balanced. I think being in New York, you do get used to getting hustled. Like, there's hustlers True. around. And like, I remember the first time when I went to Jamaica, I was on the beach, and a cat came up to me, and he's trying to sell me something for a second. I was like, yeah, right, right, right. And the dude immediately said, you're from New York, right? 
And yeah. Like, yeah. And he left he's you like, alone. He's like, okay. And he just walked away. Like, yeah. Because like, you've seen the hustle before. <laughs> right. But you learn, it, you learn it from early. Like five, you're with your mom or whatever on the street, five, six, seven, eight years old. You learn it early. There's not that type of hustle. Yeah, a lot of other places. That's right? very true. It's a, I, I, I'm, I was definitely slow. I'm still makes, slow. It makes you cynical too, being from New York. Because I remember first time I went to other places, and you go to the, you go to the store, and the person behind the counter is like, "Hi, how you doing? You have a nice And you get day? nervous. And you're like, "What do you want? <laughs> you know, like what? What? <laughs> <laughs> and then, what do you want from me? <laughs> like I'm like I'm like I'm, I hate the New York arrogant attitude, but I understand where it comes from. You know what I'm saying? But like I, I, I don't try to ever act like that when I go out of town. But someone's like, "Hey, what's going on?" I'm like. Mm. Yeah. What are you? Well, I will, but going back to Obama real quick, though, I do think that this next several months, and, it, and Nader already exposed himself. People in general, in your, in real life and daily life, are going to expose themselves, like because racism's out there, and it's a, it's just it, it, it's it's a sickness that is so deep, and that a lot of times people like you and me, and I'm talking about like white pe- white people who don't see things in terms of things like that. People can mask it a lot, but it's going to come to the surface. A lot of things are going to come to the surface because people aren't able to hold back their racism. They they wear it fairly close to their sleeve. And like you're going to find people like who you know are Democrats who are like, eh, I'm voting for McCain. And you're like, why? And they won't want to, they won't want to say it, but it's going to come to the surface. And I think there's a one of the one of the upsides of of Obama in terms of race is that people's cards are going to get pulled for how stupid this is. Like, are you really are you really making decisions based on that? That's really what you're thinking about because because when when these guys stand next to each other, when McCain and Obama stand next to each other, you're going to be very hard pressed to be an intelligent person who's going to really think that McCain is better for this country than Obama. It's going to become very difficult for people to 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 think that. I also just think that the way that Obama chooses to deal with things and and not drag things into the dirt, like even when Hillary was trying to drag him into the dirt, like he he always took the high road. He wouldn't do it. I think that that Mm -hmm. he gained a lot of respect from people from doing that, and I'm just hoping that that's going to continue through the campaign and that that even when McCain and his his troops try and, you know— Drag him through the dirt that he's going to take the high road, and just people will see that. I think. I, I think at first, it, there people had a tendency to be like, "Come on, man, fight back." But then after you do it enough times, it's like if he continues to do that, people will so appreciate the, speech, the high road. The speech he gave, what did it for me was the speech he gave about when the pastor shit was the race, happening, the race speech, the and he talked about his white grandmother and all that. That was a great. Speech. I have a white grandmother, like my my grandma's Irish, and that's what I was like. Yeah, I'm fucking with this guy. Yep, I like that. I that, that was speech. that was the speech. speech. So it's an yeah. epic speech. That's one of the I posted that on our, our link to that on our website. On, yeah, that uh, was the Boys website. That was the day. But then, um, but uh, the yeah, the race like is is that's all people see like a black guy. Well, hopefully this will be one of the things that changes it. That's the thing, though. This could this could go such a long way to making people feel differently. Could could really bring a lot of things into balance. Hey, that that was MCA from the Beastie Boys. This has been Juan Epstein. He We're going ending watch. shit again. He yeah. always ends shit pre well, <laughs> pre ender. And there, there's no chicken nuggets in here, Juanito. Why are you walking? <laughs> Juanito just walks in arbitrarily when there's food. What does Beastie mean? I was wanted. I just wanted to know that. Oh, it seemed like a funny thing when we started the. It was like a punk band that we just threw together, like. Everybody around that punk scene back then was in like five bands, and we just kind of threw it together to probably thought we'd play a couple of shows, and it seemed like a funny name. And I think if if we had any idea that it would have lasted like however many twenty five odd years that it's yeah. lasted, I probably we might have thought of something more. Something clever. better. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it worked pretty well. Yeah, it's fine. Yay, BC Boys. Woo! Are you done? Oh, now are you done? Thank you so much. Man. I won't cut. I don't want to cut you off again. Go ahead, end it. That was MCA from the Beastie Boys on one Epstein. Thanks a lot, man. Thank really pretty. Go see the movie, man. It's a wonderful movie. Go catch it. Gun in for that number one spot. Well, we'll be back. We'll be back. Where the fuck are we going? We're going to do a part <laughs> two later.